Here we are in Los Angeles in front of the Superior Courthouse again. Trying to tell people. Hi, we're the good guys. My name's Clint Eastwood, sometimes known as John Wayne. I'll be fighting corruption here. My job in fighting corruption here will be to bring a better Los Angeles to the people. To show that you don't have to be a politician to make a change. But making a change can be one man's stand against a big giant piece of marble. A marble that was once set in place by people with academic pasts who'd spent their times fighting to become families, nuclear at that, and create power and order and structure for a city that is great and for these things to symbolize that. The marble within, designed and divined by Richard Neutra, even though the man, the architect behind the idea of this building in particular, hated this building and the people who hired him for no reason other than in the 30s this city was greatly filled with corruption. He designed it sort of as a fuck you. Long halls, maze-like fucking catacombs of archives, of which the city has played an even greater joke on the people of by creating desks in the archival space itself. So windowless souls are stuck with no souls and no windows. Meaning the people work without a goddamn window up in that building, just catty corner from this. But here we are in Los Angeles, at the great Los Angeles Superior Courthouse. One of a few, but this is the one I go to predominantly. Because I fight my case here with George F. fucking Bird Jr., who is now a pussy and ran to the Compton Court because his ass couldn't take the fact that I was here. Right? Couldn't take the fact we were here. Because what we say is true. I'm your John Wayne. You're Clint Eastwood. And do you feel lucky, punk, do you? Because I do. I feel real lucky. We're lucky to be this sad, down, out, and distraught. Lost. Without a home. Because Scientology stole it in frivolous lawsuits, of which I had won the most important lawsuit of. The first and foremost realistic one that had gone to trial and had a judgment by a judge named George F. Bird Jr in which his sen senile brain could not compute the plaintiff and defendants because of an addition of a de another plaintiff and a swap of who was the plaintiff because the plaintiff had lied from day one who had done what and was trying to concoct a story that would fit their story constantly changing their facts transferring property to hide property to avoid being caught by the bankruptcy court and the court in which they were being sued for $200,000 for violations of compensation fund insurance from the state because the Secretary of State and the State Insurance Compensation Fund and the State California License Board or the Contractor State License Board, whichever you call it, the CSLB, the FTB, the IRS, they all said, where's our money, motherfuckers? You put your house in a fucking 401k. Now we want it. We want it back. Now it wasn't one house, and it wasn't even a 401k. They put their money into a fake 401k. It only existed in the title of a property being transferred. There was no actual 401k. The Chenny Shapiro 401k never existed. Chenny Shapiro 401k trust, dated January 1, 2011, is a non-existent 401k. The only 401k Jenny Shapiro has ever had that we know of for sure is called the Jenny Shapiro 401k dated January 1, 2017, started in 2017 in December. Of which she uses the name Jenny Shapiro 401k trust or Jenny Shapiro trustee to take from her funds, her properties. What do you call it? Not deposit, but withdraw. To withdraw property. By once again title transfers in the recorder's office. Title transferring to her husband, of which she says, to an unmarried man and to an unmarried woman. Blah, blah, fucking lie after fucking lie. And in this case, to Joshua T. Markinson of what in this case they say they did not call him by his name they called him by a corporation name which their lender has used a variation on many a times they called it long piat corp long plat corp 
actually Long Platt Co. But she recorded it too. My nonprofit's DBA, Long Piat Co. L O N G P I A T T space C O. Now, Long Platt is a Long Platt P L A T T. Making this quite clear that she only assigned a mortgage to Long Platt, but assigned a property to Long Piat. Of which, first of all, she had no right to assign in the first place. The place has been occupied and held in possession for a five-year period, of which is really more like a 10-year one to my wife and I. But for my wife and I, from November 6th, I'm sorry, November 9th, 2016, to now, we are the possessors. And on November 9th, 2021, we became the five-year mark completing our adverse possession of open, continuous, exclusive, notorious, right, one where the taxes are paid. The taxes are paid by whom you ask, and it does not matter at some point, some point, it is a null question because the lender from the prior instance who allowed a straw buyer to purchase five properties in continuous loans, just being taken out one after another, at the same time, Two million here, a million there, another two million here, another million there, over and over. Iona, Terry, LLC, 1968 Avon, LLC, fucking 4122, Vantage, LLC, and it goes on and on and on. You see, Lending Home Funding Corporation did not give a fucking shit about the right or wrong thing to do in underwriting a loan or a mortgage for anyone whatsoever in the last 10 fucking years. They have done nothing but supply millions and millions and billions of dollars of loans to people who are not capable to be underwritten in any way, shape, or form. Their underwriting would have basically presupposed that all of their mortgages were in good faith, but they were all in bad faith. Every single one of them. There might be one or two out of the hundreds they've done that have been a legitimate mortgage, but they are basically providing a false business model to undermine the United States economy. Why would they do such a thing? Well, because it makes Matthew Humphrey, the CEO, a very rich man. It makes every single party involved a very wealthy person in a transaction that only profits for every party involved except for the person defrauded in what would basically be unjust enrichment your underwriters, your escrow agents, your notaries, your property inspectors, your permitters, your contractors, all corrupt. And all making profit from such an incident. So why does Lending Home not catch the original straw buyer? His name is the one and only Stephen William Snyder. There are a few of him. But this one pretends to be a television and film TV producer in Los Angeles. He's a tall, young, not that young, but 42-ish. Piece of shit from Synecdoche, New York, basically on a street called Crooked. He is from Crooked Street in Upper New York. Is Synecdoche? Anyway, near Synecdoche. His parents had an anniversary recently and he posted a YouTube video in which he has a Wonder Years style slideshow and gives a little speech and he breaks down and admits himself the failure he is for being back at home with his parents because COVID has begun and he has bankrupted his fraudulent companies and been caught in six or seven fraud cases and being tried in almost all of them in civil court because nobody has brought him to a criminal court yet. Stephen William Snyder uses my house as a Ponzi scheme, basically, to tell people that they're going to profit off the sale of 1968 Avon LLC, a venture in which he needs to borrow more and more money. And he sells the property multiple times to multiple people, supposedly, but never in title form, only in a private contract that nobody has any paper for. And they all claim it in their causes of action and their claims in their lawsuits against him, which involves, in one instance, um, Les Cohen's versus Snyder. Now, there are six open cases simultaneously, and then there is a bankruptcy proceeding that Snyder himself initiated. He is then caught in the bankruptcy proceeding by some of the debt collectors for 4122 Vantage. 
4122 Vantage is where he dumped the money from 1968 Avon's loans and mortgages that he was assigning to his straw buyer, Brendan James Jimenez. Brendan James Jimenez, a Los, Los Gatos, um, a person from Los Gatos, his parents at least, that's where his parents reside. Having had a small business called DJ Maps and living in Santa Monica and in other places in Los Angeles, scared for his life, won't answer a phone call. But his mommy did, and she said, yeah, well, uh, who are you? Yes, he bought a house, but I'm not, uh, okay, I'll pass on the message. Um, what are you gonna do to him? It's my son, I'm so worried. I said, nothing, I would like to help your son not get in trouble. Your son was frauded by Stephen William Snyder in a mortgage fraud, in one in which they had intended to basically dump the property from person to person, and it could never have been purchased in the first place. Why am I so angry? I have every reason to be. I feel like Bobcat Goldthwait or fucking even better. I feel like the ref. You know who the ref is? Well, his name evades me, but he's a comedian from the 90s, 80s. He's got a big, thick, cussing mouth, cocaine addiction, and a cigarette in his mouth at all times. He's tall as shit. Dennis Leary. That's right, Dennis Leary. Brennan James Jimenez, his parents are worried about him because him and Christopher Lilly and Ryan Zhang, all people from DJ Maps, they had one other company involved with Stephen William Snyder, like I just said, Christopher Lilly, Julia Franklin, Stephen Snyder's cousin or a friend or family or sister. All start PLM. Uh, you have to forgive me. I'm going through stomach ache. Uh, horrible stomach ache. PLM is private money loan. It's a website, not only a fucking three letter acronym of stupidity. And PLM is an application website for a private money lender to give you a, a loan. Put down all your personal details. You will give that to them, and in turn, they will use that to apply for a loan at Lending Home Funding Corporation's website. Now that you've given up your personal, most important details, you're asking for, let's say, $100,000. It's not that much, right? They take out a loan for a million, right? And you give you your loan, give or take a little bit. I'm not sure what. They assign your loan, a trust or a trustee or whatever you call that. Sometimes being themselves through a various variation on their company names, because they have shells, all at 30 Gold Street, Wyoming, Sheridan. Sheridan, Wyoming, and all at 5062, something like that, Lancashire Boulevard, Los Angeles, California, Studio City, blah de fucking blah Always at the two same places. Now, if you have five mortgages out, or five different properties, all from Lending Home, with straw buyers up the ass, doesn't matter who they are, but they all have the same two addresses, should the underwriters find out Immediately. I mean, it's not hard. A cross-reference database is like a fucking Excel spreadsheet. You hit click on one channel, on one column, and all of a sudden, all the columns that say 5062 Langston Boulevard should pop the fuck up. So why don't they do that? Isn't that a requirement? It's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. It's MERS. It's this, it's that. Right? That's what the forms say at the bottom on the ATLA forms or the, you know, title, American Real Estate Brokers Title Association blog. Says that at the bottom. Says it's an official form. Says photocopying, changing these forms is fucking illegal. Does that matter to them? Why don't they give a shit? How come it isn't misrepresentation of their mortgages? 
They're, they're documents, they're lending documents. So how come that's not considered misrepresentation? Any misrepresentation in the application of a mortgage of any kind is considered mortgage fraud. Why is they not doing something about that? It's because the lender himself, themselves, are committing predatory mortgage lending. It's an illegal thing. I'm not sure if it's Frank Dodd or I think it is Frank Dodd. Frank Dodd Act is supposed to put an end to that bullshit. Well, Lending Home gets away with it to the point that they change their goddamn name to uh, Lavia or something like that. Let me treat to. It doesn't matter. They change their name to something arbitrary that has no reference point to lending home, but to another lending institution that has a similar fucked up fake name to cover its assets and asses. To trick people into participating further. Now they don't take out loans to people that are sole individuals anymore during COVID. They go strictly to LLCs and entities only, right? So you see a huge increase. You see the servicer that helps them set it up, switch to an address in Florida, a single address. You see Cindy Moss pop up on all these attempts to illegally transfer properties that they lost from basically not having anybody to actually service the property. No, what do they call that? When you have someone service property, it's a receiver, no receivers. They don't have a fucking receiver. The receivers don't exist. And without a receiver, they have no one to go claim these properties that are defaulted, that have nobody living in them anymore because the person who defaulted defaulted because they were a straw buyer in the first place and intended to run with the money. And that means that the property was left abandoned for an abundant amount of time. Two, three, four, five years, just like my property, right? No receiver, what happens? Five years go by. Hmm. Someone's living there and they're fixing it, taking care of it, doing the proper things for adverse possession, like I did. What happens? Well, they should have done a proper foreclosure sale at nine months out from the 90 days out from the foreclosure note, uh, recording of the note and the putting it in the newspaper. Should have had a non judicial foreclosure sale at a fountain. But did they do that? No. They were supposed to, but we called them and told them you can't. Called and told them we can't. And what the fucking lawyer say uh, yes we can fuck you hangs up sons of bitches so do they no December 12th 2019 they try what happens on December 12th 2019 I go to the notary to get my preservation of interest signed for months of trying to understand what the hell that thing is and my wife passes out in the FedEx so do we get back to the recorder in time? No. But do we get to the notary in time? Yes. Does it get recorded for a while? No. Do we notify them? Yes. Do they sell it that day? No. Do they claim they do? Yes. December 24th, 2019. They try it again. Do they sell it? No, it never goes to the fountain sale. No one ever plans on doing that. They just did a quick claim, recorded that. Secretly, if they'd had a sale, the sale would have allowed for that to happen. Three days would have passed post that. It would have been five days after that for the fucking money to go through the sale. So the backside of the transfer document notice says that um, this is a cash only sale. And I'm doing this from memory, but the cash only sale says or we'll use the credit we're allowed through the fact that there's an, uh, losses of money from the exchange. So it's basically our credit that we're buying it on. Well, it's not a credit transaction. It's a cash only sale for the full amount, right? So they buy it for the full amount? No, $999,999 or some shit like that. No, they do. Hundred thousand or two hundred thousand? They might even no. They did it for six hundred and twenty. Six hundred twenty. 
620,000. All right. $300,000 deficit right there, okay? $300,000 deficit. Right. So then it's listed after that. Who did they sell it to? Well, they said quality loan service was going to be in charge of that. But quality loan service wasn't the servicer or the trustee or trustor. They weren't substituted in because it was a title company that was supposed to be in, uh, American First Title Agency. Something like that. Were they in charge of that transfer? No. Wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't quality loan service like it was supposed to be either. I mean, look, they eventually tried to cheat their way and say it was. No. It was a quick claim from Lending Home Funding Corporation to WFSB, not in its sole capacity as Christiana Trust, but in its certificate form to WFSB's one and only NRP Mortgage Trust One. So a trust that has an entity within an entity, and they use this guy named Kevin Chase Scott. He works as Alpha Flow. Alpha Flow is the name of his company. But at the time, he worked for Lending Home Funding Corporation as a servicing agent that is not a listed servicing agent, but appears somehow randomly as a servicing agent at the last moment. But he is really a programmer, a programmer who worked for Matthew Humphrey at Lending Home Funding Corporation. And he acts as attorney in fact for WFSB for Lending Home Funding Corporation as a servicing agent to transfer the title to and from lending home to WFSP's NRP Mortgage Trust One, which is a sub company of the Christiana Trust. So he transfers it from himself to himself to his entity, to his trust trust entity, of which neither the trusts trust, Christiana Trust or NRP Mortgage Trust are in the jurisdictional bounds to do such business with such an entity as Kevin J. Scott as their attorney in fact because you can't do that but they're from Delaware not Philadelphia where the transfer happens even though it's in a California fucking property I'm using a notary Cindy Moss who's dead by the way dead before the transfer even happens you have to ask yourself do you feel lucky punk do you I sure don't. Maybe this luck in this thing. It'd be cool if somebody gave me one. I deserve one. Come on. There's one. Oh. My luck ain't there right now. It's there sometimes. Kevin Chase Scott, he appears on uno, dos, maybe tres documents. So I look at his own document history within recorders, whatnot, the web, and I come across a New Jersey transfer of property for $110 for a $10 purchase for his own property using Cindy Moss and Teresa Hunt and Teresa. Uh, Christian and Christian uh, last name fails me same people though same transfer agents same notary oh, within a couple days so he flew from New Jersey to California to Texas in a couple of days to do these transfers how many transfers to Lending Home do that week? About 200. About 200. That I can see. And that's 200. There's another one in LA. My zip code or one zip code away. 39 or 26. I think it was in 27. 
where they do a seizure of the property. They seize the property because of a default. So they try to use the same tactic, quick claim to NRP Mortgage Trust One. Why? Because they split it and bifurcate it. They bifurcate the mortgage into three entities. Confusing the recorder, making it impossible for a human being to communicate with those entities, leaving no contacting agent in any of the documentation, no way to actually have a communications with them. That's illegal under the California Mortgage Protection Act. I have no communications with the servicing agent. Yes, I am allowed to be a party to this transaction because I am a person in possession of the property. And I've notified them. And it's obvious I'm an adverse possessor. I've fenced in the property. I live at the property. The property is advancedly developed. I have completely restored the property. I am qualified to be a party to the transaction. They must notify me. They must participate in transactions. They will not only be suffice in notifying 30 Gould, Sheridan, Wyoming, or 5062, Lancashire Boulevard. They must also notify 1968 Avon, LLC, I mean, sorry, 1968 Avon Street, 90026, and 1410 Ewing Street, 90026, California. And they do not. That is considered not communicating or representing themselves well to the parties that have interest. I have interest recorded. I have interest recorded on the web. At that point in time, you could not fail to find out about this because... <coughs> You know how noisy I am? I invented photo blogging. That sounds cocky as shit. I invented photo blogging. Gip Decor, don't know the guy, but he's the other one who invented it. He got so pissed that I got the credit. He said he wanted his name first. I didn't even ask for the name. Title representation of that. I was voted or chosen or whatever you want to call it by Nick Curry, Momus, on the internet on imomus.com back in 2004 as the inventor of photo blogging. Do you want to know what that entailed in a nutshell real quick? I used to break in to my friends' photo albums while they'd let me couch surf their house or clean their kitchen or do some good for them because that's what I would do while I was traveling around trying to go to UCLA math classes I needed to get into architecture school or whatever. Summer, was from Los Angeles, time. I'd spent that entire year in San Francisco at school. My friend Lance, Dallas Reyes, AKA Rambo. Some people say he's dead and I don't believe it. I hope not. He was my friend. But he went to jail. He worked for Look Look, style hunting, cool hunting organization. The beginning of that on the web when it was an important company. And he had a Nikon Coolpix they gave him and the job was to go around and photograph kids' clothes by request from art schools and people who were hip and be in the know and be a trendsetter and know what trendsetting is and know who is making those changes and give that data, that, me that special data to Look Look. Well, he picked me, one visited him in jail, my girlfriend at the time, Amber Nicole Gavin and I went and we had photos of that whole incident and hanging out with him in jail in his oranges. It was sad to see him there, but he gave me that job and I lived on his back porch in the laundry room. She and I did it together. We got followed every day by the gang enforcement officer, Officer Putz, who would try to figure out more about San Francisco's conceptual graffiti team, uh, scene, not team, KUK and GSB and two over 10 and you know, we had dang diggity dog dig dog dang safari cat, cat, dog, fucking amaze, fucking percept, fuck. It was all over the place. San Francisco was a cool school of graffiti. Probably one of the best scenes in the States. And I lived like king, going over percept going over a maze, climbing on, on cranes that lift containers to write Marco, 
where there was a polo on the next one. I would put a wave everywhere else in the city and Saddam was my other name. I wrote Saddam, but really Rambo started Saddam for me and created the myth. Together we would run at night hopping rooftop and I would take all the photographs from all the graffiti kids who would give them to me. Every single person. I would take photographs from all my artist friends at houses and scan them. I would take photographs of my own. I would take photographs from everybody. And I would build conceptual curated libraries of photos of what it was life in hipster culture, what it was like in our culture, what it was like in our time. And I would create databases and using a photo indexing program ACDC, I would create photo pages in HTML and I'd publish them on the web. And my teachers would say they'd see me 24 hours a day in the photo lab at the computer lab at the San Francisco Art Institute. And I was there with Nate Boys and all we were doing was uploading and uploading. And all I was doing is uploading and all he was doing was deconstructing rhizomatic sound into image through fucking Max and Jitter. And together we were both just doing something different than everybody else. I was up there making everybody's lives a part of a library of what images are on the internet. And somebody found it somewhere from Vice Magazine named Momus or Nick Curry. And he made an article about it. And it began this whole diatribe of what is photo blogging, what is the photo essay, what is photo journalism. And I, proudly, years later, declare that was a great moment. Because I was declared the moment in my life where I didn't realize I'd made a change in the world, but it was photo blogging. I invented the photo blog. So here I am telling you about all this other stuff because for 14 years in the middle I fought corruption within American Apparel's fucking lawsuits from these women who are suing for sexual harassment as a way to undermine the corporation for some of the boards of directors who planned a coup for a long time to take the power and money away from the Charney family and give it to the Guildman and family from Montreal. Both Montreal families at war for decades. Secretly using standard investment and Robert Greene from 48 Laws of Power, they established a coup against Dove Charney and created a series of faux campaigns against him and his sexual harassment suits that were orchestrated by women who were hired by Robert Greene and his pals, such as John Luttrell, the CFO of the company at the time, who'd been placed in there as a stand-in by a white knight, or supposedly, but a black knight lawyer in dark art media get his name, but he's the same guy who worked for Johnny Depp at some point. We'll get back to his name. And American Apparel's whole situation taught me the basics of law until eventually one day I fought an unlawful detainer and won. So when my wife and I engaged in our second and only unlawful detainer that we were unfortunately forced to deal with, we kicked its ass and we said never one thing that wasn't true. We walked the line of the law at all times and kept our truth and trust within the law and doing everything right for the purposes of making sure justice was completely clear. We were the good side and we, through adverse possession, clear the title of its deficiencies, its clouded title, because not just the two people I've described, such as Jenny Shapiro and her family, Richard Judson Williams and Ken Shapiro, and then this guy, Steven Schneider Pryor, defrauded my property. But every single person since Fred Medell and his wife owned the property have defrauded my home's property, which involves Eric Hill. He has just been recently caught in the New Jersey area or something for mortgage fraud and 12 other people and gotten sentenced by the federal courts for conspiracy to commit mortgage fraud. That's same time he left here is when he pops up there and my house was the last piece of property he defrauded in California to my knowledge under DBKNS properties Eric Hill and Associates Eric Hill Andrew Wassef Eco Modular all these entities and more completely full of shit shell companies buying up hillside regulated homes that are in REAP and Ellis Act constraints on the land and they do whatever they want to pretend to Ellis remove through the right procedures yet never paying the relocation fees tenant habitability plans taking care of the properties violations or of any kind they merely just do this for flips that are quick on properties that cannot be financed and are not allowed to be transferred because they're in reap and are protected by these Ellis constraints never living there and filing all the con 
all the permits to say that they're the owner builder and they're doing owner move in. Well, they're liars. Ecomodular, DPK, and S. Eric Hill, Andrew Wasif, and their other conspirators eventually transferred to Saw Investments, who does the same thing. And they transferred to 1968 Avon, LLC. This property has notice constraints on the land, saying that it cannot be sold to anyone unless it is for owner move-in. This is never performed, and they only attempt eviction, in which the last party, Ruben Pena, the son, sorry, the, the cousin of Fred Medell, is sued and fights in court and wins. Wins in the Santa Monica court. He has autism, and he wins. And the ruling on it, stating that he is a tenant of his family and has paid a little amount of money, even a dollar, at any point ever, and is thereby considered to be granted the rights of a tenant no matter what and will no longer be subject to anything other than the same rights and responsibilities that a person has anyway. So an Ellis Act eviction is illegal unless it is for the right reasons and he lived there and he had the rights to be there and it was se senior and he extended it properly and he has to be able to move back in and they gave him nothing and screwed him over even though he won so when i find the place with no doors no locks nothing in the hole of the lock nothing keeping it closed tools abandoned plants overgrown and i take it and restore it all the way to its complete and total hole what the fuck is wrong with this city and state for not protecting me in my actions, for the police harassing me in my actions, for my neighbors coming to my trust and my aid and helping me and me helping them and us becoming a community, doing nothing for me other than allowing the police to stumble and step and accuse and make shit up except for one officer who was a great man, Officer Geico. He understood we were being harassed and another great man works for CSLB, Richard Montelier, and the other man whose name I do not know, who works for the Secret Service. These three entities said, I will not stand for willful intimidation, sir. Well, I now won't stand for willful intimidation. I was willfully intimidated, and I'm finally fed the fuck up. But to Officer Garcia, Galindo, Gutierrez, Kelly, you are all pieces of LAPD shit. Fucking scum fucking shit from the Northeast Division, except for Garcia, who's from Central. And he's the biggest scum of all, with Sanchez, his little partner of crime, accusing people, making out false gang cards, fucking coming over and making noise complaints that are phony, that we were tried for in a city attorney's hearing and won because he lied point blank and it's on video because I had seven ring cameras up at all fucking three years of the fucking time that ring existed during the time of the five years that I possessed my house. So everything's on video. Garcia's fucking 25 feet from my front door, not 150 yards. It's daytime, not 11.30 at night. There is no noise. My wife's going to school for music. We have the right. We're in a decibel meter on our property with a number sticking out the window, and you can see it's below the legal limit by far. We have no neighbors in the first place except for one, and she's at work, and she doesn't give a shit. She likes our music. The rest of the neighbors at the bottom of the hill and valley like our music and support it and talk to us daily. In fact, they give us notes basically affirming our adverse possession and their approval of it and how we change the community for the better giving the view back to the community that had not been there for 30 years we stopped a gang house from being a gang house we helped the gang members get jobs we helped the gang members find themselves a voice we helped our neighborhood and gentrify itself in a healthy manner in which two different worlds could be polarized and come together into one unity Mavira Loca, the sad girl house, my house, becomes known as the little Redwood house. The consular outpost and annex of Catalonia. Once a bar being used by gang members, now a restored, respected consular outpost and annex with 614 different fauna and flora being grown that are from natural indigenous region of that spe specific area, finding under the house architectural heritage, going back to the fucking Mexican-American War and beyond, 
and collecting all of its archaeological pieces to show the historic importance of this property, finding out that the house is fucking vernacular style needed to be completely kept up for its historical context and giving it that love it deserved. Re-piping, re-electrifying, re re-lighting, re-gardening, re-landscaping, re-siding, re-painting, 